Greetings, everyone, and welcome to another Batman 80th Anniversary Review. Today we're going to be talking about the 1968 animated series from Filmation. Yeah, so let's get right to it, today on the Multimedia Chronicles. Welcome back. So in 1967, Filmation Studios got their first big contract with DC Comics to produce The New Adventures of Superman. Well, I'm guessing that DC Comics liked what they saw because the following year, they expanded Filmation's license to also include Batman. So Batman first appeared in animated form in September of 1968 when uh, Superman came back for a second season and it was combined into the Batman Superman Hour. Well, I guess the Superman Batman Hour. So it would essentially feature one half hour episode of Batman and a half hour episode of Superman, usually comprising of two two part stories. So one story would be presented in two parts over the course of the half hour and then just kind of broken up in the hour. Uh, later on, Batman was actually sectioned off into its own half hour show with a new title sequence called The Adventures of Batman and Robin. And that's the version that appears on the DVD set here. Now it is worthy to note that in March of that year, the Adam West live action series actually ended its three year run. So, for a few months there, uh, Batman fans were without any new Batman stuff on TV. But then this animated series came along and kind of filled the void a little bit. So Batman is voiced by Olin Sewell, who actually voiced the Cave Crusader on many of the Super Friends series. And Robin is voiced by Casey Kasem, who also voiced Robin on many of the Super Friends series. Super Friends, of course, was produced by Hanna-Barbera. Uh, starting, I think, in 1972, if I remember correctly, so four years after this. But uh, I guess Olin Sewell and Casey Kasem made a big enough impression in, with their performance in this series that uh, they got the roles on the Super Friends shows as well. So as far as Batman shows go, honestly, I really enjoyed this one a lot. I don't think I had ever seen it before. Now, of course, I'd seen the Adam West show uh, for many, many years as a kid and, and always loved it. And I remember thinking as a kid, seeing the animated intro for the live action show, thinking that, wow, I really wish there was a Batman cartoon. Of course, I had no idea at the time there, there had actually been a couple of cartoons by that point, but, uh, I guess they just weren't on in my area, not in any repeats or anything like that. So interesting to note, I guess while we're talking about anniversaries, this would have aired during Batman's 29th anniversary, and the final episode actually aired originally on January 1st of 1969, which of course was just entering into the 30th anniversary of Batman. So appropriate that there was some kind of Batman on screen at the time during, during the uh, 30th anniversary. Now if you're wondering about the roster of characters in this show, well, of course we had... Batman and Robin, and here you can see them both in and out of their costumes. And of course we have stately Wayne Manor, tended as always by the ever-faithful Alfred. Alfred would actually help Batman and Robin out in some of their cases too, which was nice to see, very much like he does in the comics. And they're always ably assisted and called upon by Commissioner Gordon, who strangely appears to be a younger Commissioner Gordon in this. He doesn't have his mustache. But also worthy to note is Chief O'Hara is in this. Which is interesting because Chief O'Hara was actually a creation of the live action series. He was not from the comic books. So this is one of the few times that O'Hara actually appeared outside of the live action series. We also have the Commissioner's daughter, Barbara Gordon, also known as Batgirl. Yeah, so Batgirl often joins the dynamic duo and uh, does her best to help out. However, as I was watching this uh, series with Skin Slip a little while ago, we kind of noticed that Batgirl seems to be the Tigra 
of this particular series. Uh, we noted a while back when we were watching Thundercats that Tigra, for all that he's hyped up in the opening titles and whatnot, is actually kind of a useless character and often ends up getting himself in trouble more than anything else when he's trying to help the other Thundercats and they end up having to rescue him. Well, that's that's kind of Batgirl in this series. She's often getting herself caught or trapped or in peril in some way, and then Batman and Robin have to come along and rescue her, just kind of dropping whatever they're doing to go and save Batgirl when she's trying to help. So for notable bat vehicles and related things, we of course have the bat signal whenever uh, Commissioner Gordon needs the help of the dynamic duo. We've got the Batmobile. I actually really like this design of the Batmobile. You can see a couple different shots of it here. We've got the Bat Plane, the Bat Boat, and here you can see Batman and Robin in their scuba gear. We of course have the Bat Copter. And Robin even has the Bat Gyro, which I think appeared in the live action series, if I'm not mistaken. So here you can see him taking off from the cave and then heading off to help out Batman. So for the Rogues Gallery, we have quite a pantheon of familiar faces straight out of the comic books. Uh, first up, of course, we have Catwoman, who has this strange kind of green outfit that I've never seen in any other version of Batman before, but... Okay. As far as her characterization goes and sort of her motivations, it's very similar to Catwoman from the comics and from the TV show. Namely, she's a top-tier thief who likes to steal things of note. In one episode, she doesn't even bother to break in. She just steals a whole darn castle. And one of her other big motivations is she's always trying to find out who Batman really is. There's actually some pretty fun episodes where she almost figures out his secret identity, but Batman manages to skunk her in the end in some way and uh, either throw enough of a reasonable doubt on her suspicion or completely throw her off the trail entirely. And Catwoman is ably assisted by her Catman henchman. Yeah, one of the things you'll notice is all of the main villains in this have henchmen that have outfits that kind of relate to whatever the, the villain is, but you, you'll see as we go here. Then, of course, we have the Joker. Uh, the Joker seems to look much like he does in the uh, Silver Age and Bronze Age comics. The, the costume and everything and appearance is, is pretty much in tune with that. And he is, of course, ably assisted by his henchmen, who all look like jesters. Joker also has his own super-powered vehicle, the Jokermobile, where the front end looks like a huge pair of smiling lips. <laughs> and his base of operations is this very subtle and inconspicuous mansion made entirely out of cards. Well, at least it looks like cards. I mean, it's not literally cards, but yeah, really subtle there, Joker. Then we have the Mad Hatter, who actually only appears in one episode, but uh, this appears to be an earlier version of the Mad Hatter, where he was basically just this crazy guy who had a thing for Alice in Wonderland. This is before they really got into the whole thing about mind control and whatnot that he's known for now. I do like his vehicle, which looks like a big hat <laughs> on wheels, and he's ably assisted by a bunch of white rabbits and a bunch of henchmen that are dressed up to look like characters from Alice in Wonderland. And then we have Mr. Freeze. Now, this is, of course, the old Mr. Freeze before the 90s Batman animated series actually made him interesting. Yeah, I was never a big fan of Mr. Freeze uh, before the animated series, honestly. So essentially, this is the standard, classic, Silver Age Mr. Freeze. He has his freeze gun, he has his cryo suit that keeps him cool. His henchmen in this aren't particularly dressed up like a lot of the other villains. They're basically just thugs with toques. <laughs> I do like that his super vehicle is an ice cream truck, which I think is kind of logical in terms of being able to mount the freeze ray on the back and have it mobile and such. And I just had to grab this shot here of Mr. Freeze looking rather dainty. I don't know why, that's that's just how he was sitting in that shot. Then of course we have the Penguin, which is the classic Silver Age Penguin. He's all about birds and umbrellas. Um, 
yeah. His henchmen are basically dressed up like birdmen, as you might expect. It seems like kind of a, an uncomfortable costume, to be perfectly honest, especially if the weather's a little warm. And he's got these flying umbrellas that he just sort of floats around in and goes from place to place. There's one episode in particular where he, he's actually teamed up with some of the other bad guys. And there's a shot where he's rocketing through the house on a jet-propelled umbrella. It's like, dude, you're in the house. Why are you using the jet-propelled umbrella indoors? Then we have the Riddler. And this is very much the classic portrayal of the Riddler. Uh, he has his standard green suit with question marks all over it, and he's all about confounding Batman and Robin with his riddles. And his henchmen are, don't have anything particularly interesting about their outfit. It's basically just, you know, kind of workman's outfit with a mask, and that's it. One thing I did find interesting, though, is he has, I think, more vehicles than any other villain in the entire series. Uh, in an earlier episode, he has this Riddler mobile. This is the only decent shot I could get of it. I think it's the only way we see it, actually, in that episode is from overhead. It's just an orange car with a question mark on it. But then later on, he has the Riddler copter. So it's kind of the counterpart to the Bat copter. So it's a green helicopter with question marks on it. And then he's got a Riddler van, which is this pink van with question marks on it. So. Yeah, I don't know what the Riddler's doing that the other guys aren't, but he seems to be doing pretty well. I also kind of enjoyed the voice performance of this character. The The actor who does him uh, did him kind of like uh, James Cagney. So he's like, hey, I'm the Riddler, and I'm going to confound you with my riddles. He's like, the t totally the you dirty rat kind of thing. You dirty rat, I'm the Riddler. And he does that voice for it, but I don't know. I kind of dug it, to be perfectly honest. There were also quite a few episodes where the villains team up to try to defeat the dynamic duo and take over the city or whatever their plans are. We had a few team-ups of Joker, Penguin, and Riddler. One of just the Joker and Riddler. And one that I really liked, actually, which was Riddler and Catwoman. So you have the two green-suited villains. But get this, they had their base in the sewer. And check out this shot. This just cracks me up. So they're kind of chilling in their base, reading the newspaper. There's this elaborate winding staircase up to the lounge area and a chandelier. They're in the sewer. But hey, this goes to show no matter how squalid your surroundings, you can always spruce things up a little bit, I guess. It's all a matter of how rich you feel, right? Finally, a few honorable mentions for the rogues gallery, a few other villains that only had one or two appearances apiece. We had the Scarecrow. Yeah, I really like the Scarecrow now, like in his current incarnation, because I find him really interesting how he uses the fear toxin and sort of tries to use your worst fears against you. Yeah, this was before that was a thing with the Scarecrow. And in this one, he's basically just a costumed villain. Nothing really special about him. He kind of looks like a clown. And he just used these little pellets, which I thought, oh, that must be the fear toxin. But nope, they're just knockout gas. So that's it. The Scarecrow's just a fairly run-of-the-mill costume villain that just knocks people out and kidnaps them and stuff. Yeah. He would be made much more interesting in later years. Then we had a few villains that only ever existed in this series. We had the Judge, who was a judge was evil. We had Dollman, who used uh, kind of, he was kind of like Marvel's Puppet Master, but this is the Doll Man, and he made these dolls that would come to life and uh, attack people and steal things and whatnot. And then finally, we had Simon the Pie Man. Simon the Pie Man actually appeared in two episodes, so I guess they thought they were really onto a winner character here. Yeah, Simon the Pie Man, as you might expect, has an affinity for baked goods and using them for evil and he also likes to dress in drag because you know he was pretty sure that nobody would recognize him at all if he dressed in drag and funny enough it seems to work it pulls the wool over the cape crusaders eyes every single time but hey whatever floats your boat simon i'm not here to judge so last but certainly not least over the course of watching these, I noticed uh, once in a while there would be errors in the animation. And of course, being filmation and being on a very tight budget, a lot of these errors made their way into the final product and were never fixed. For example, there's this one where Batman has a reverse Bat logo. 
And you notice he's throwing the Batarang from the left of the screen to the right. Every single time he would throw the Batarang from the left of the screen to the right, it would be this exact same shot and the Bat logo was reversed. It was fine whenever he would fire the Batarang from right to left. That shot was fine, but the other one always had the reverse Bat logo, so it was obviously the same handful of cells just being reused over and over again for that. But hey, gotta save money, right? There were some other instances of reverse Bat logo, or no Bat logo, or no pants. Yeah, I don't know what happened there. This uh, It's literally that one shot, and only that one time. <laughs> Suddenly, Batman and Robin aren't wearing pants. I have no idea what happened there. That's one they did correct for later uses of that same pose, but that one shot made it into the final show where they're, they are pantsless, and I don't know why. Anyway, bottom line is... Um, I really enjoyed this show a lot, and it's one I think I will revisit from time to time because it was a lot of fun. Um, I mean, it's just very innocent Saturday morning fare uh, featuring a lot of familiar Batman heroes and villains, and I liked it a lot. And best of all, the DVD is super cheap, so if you want to add it to your collection, by all means, go for it. It's not going to put you back too much. Um, I've included an Amazon link in the description if you'd like to add it to your collection. So thank you very much for your support. appreciate that. Just one more thing. If you were wondering sort of about the contents of the DVD set, I have these lovely cover scans you can take a look at. So that's the, uh, the front cover there. Very nice. And then we have the back cover. The advantages of having a scanner. <laughs> And then inside, it is actually a two-disc set with all 16 half-hour episodes that they did. So each episode is basically a, a two-part story and then a single-part story. So it's just kind of, you know, one long story and one short one. So you get a nice variety of content for each episode. But uh, yeah, good stuff. 68 Batman. Gotta love it. Alrighty, well, that is it for this review. Hope you enjoyed, and we'll see you next time for another one. I've actually got another animated series to talk about, namely, The New Adventures of Batman and Robin. Yeah, so this is another one by Filmation from 1977. That one's also notable, by the way, in that it features the long-awaited return of Adam West and Burt Ward as the voices of Batman and Robin. But we'll talk about that next time. In the meantime, thanks for watching. Big thanks to my Patreon sponsors. Be sure to join me on Twitch. I stream just about every day doing stuff like this and games and geek chat and whatever else. And I'll see you next time. Until then, sayonara.